Can I just start by saying that Security Breach Ruin was amazing? It fixed all the problems that I had with Security Breach and added some really cool and intriguing mechanics. The letter, which is kind of why we're here today. My goal for this video is to fill in the blanks on the events leading up to Ruin. Things are very different from how we left them in Security Breach. So what happened exactly? Who is the Mimic and how did it get there? Who set up the Vany network and how does it work? What is Mexus and who created it? There's a lot to address here, so let's just dive right in. First off, I have to address the big topic of debate in the FNAF community. And yes, I did just coin the term FNAF. Um, I used it jokingly the other day and my husband said that I needed to start using it unironically. So um, if you're into FNAF, you're now FNAF. -y. I don't make the rules except for this instance, I guess I do. Anyway, one of the most divisive words that a FNAF can utter right now is books. Specifically, Tales from the Pizzaplex. With the Silver Eyes trilogy, Scott made very clear that it was canon, but in a different continuity. And he made the same thing clear about Fazbear Frights. That didn't mean that we couldn't use stuff from the books to figure out the lore. We were encouraged to do so but it was parallels instead of an exact retelling of the events in the game timeline. So the problem comes with Tales of the Pizzaplex, which lines up a lot more with Security Breach than any of the books have previously. It's even what made us aware of the Mimic and where it was located. So it's got to be one-to-one, -one, right? I'm gonna level with you. I tried so hard to justify this. Things would be so much more simple if we could take the books at face value and know that the backstory for the Mimic outlined there is the same as the games because they're one and the same. But I couldn't make it work. Yes, there are different attractions in the short stories than we see at the Pizzaplex in the games. And even though that would mean a lot of changes within the five years the Pizzaplex has been opened, I could excuse that. The real problem comes with the stories that actually give us the details about the Mimic. The Mimic and the Storyteller. Which kind of seems intentional to me. Like this is where they knew we were going to look after they introduced the Mimic and Ruin. And it's also where the books can't line up with the games. We're told in the books that Edwin graduated from college in the early 70s and pretty much immediately got married and started his business. He's then shown to be 24 when his wife is pregnant. The Mimic story takes place when his son is about four or five and then in the storyteller, he's 64. So breaking this down, the last year of the early 70s is obviously 1974 and most people graduate from college around 22, but I want to make this work, so let's be generous and say that Edwin was super smart and graduated early, or maybe only got a two-year degree. So let's say he was 20 in 1974. So this means Fiona would have been pregnant in 1978. And again, being generous with time, the mimic would take place in 1983. Here we're already running into a bit of a hiccup because at this point, Fastware Entertainment has already bought out Edwin's business, but the company didn't form until 1983. I guess it could technically work, but the real issues come in with the storyteller, which according to the ages that we just calculated would take place in 2018. And I have no way to possibly justify the Pizzaplex being open before the events of FNAF 3 and FNAF 6, which take place in 2023. It's just not possible. But you know what? Scott has been inconsistent about dates and ages in the past. Though admittedly, normally that's when there's just one date or age mentioned, not several that are listed throughout two stories to give us a pretty solid timeline of a man's life. But Let's see if there's any way we can reverse engineer this, allowing for possible mistakes. So the earliest I'm comfortable with the Pizzaplex opening 
is 2024 and dang they rushed to build that on top of the FNAF 6 pizzeria but fine whatever so if the storyteller takes place the year that the Pizzaplex opened that would mean Edwin is 64 in 2024 so that means he would have been 24 in 1984 so that would mean the mimic would take place 1988 to 1989 but at that time Fazbear Entertainment is not the powerful entity that was described in the story so maybe this one those mistakes maybe Scott did an oopsie and Edwin was actually supposed to be 24 at the time of the mimic that would put the mimic taking place in 1984 which actually works really well okay so then that would mean when Edwin graduated in 1974, he would have been 14. No, no, that, that doesn't work. You see the problem. In order to make these stories work with the game timeline, we have to assume multiple mistakes. And I'm just not comfortable doing that without some kind of inconsistency to make me think that it's wrong. Like I said, it almost seems intentional that it's in these two stories specifically that it doesn't line up with the games. Almost as if it's there to tell us it is in a different continuity. And I know I'll see this in the comments so I'm going to go ahead and address it. I know Scholastic said in the synopsis of Tales from the Pizzaplex that Tales is set in the world of the games. But Scott has used similar language when he said the books are in the same universe, the same world, just different continuities. It's not really any different than what has been said in the past. So is there a chance that Scott and Steel Wool will throw out the dates and decide to make it all in the same timeline? Yes. But until that happens, I'm going to operate under the belief that they are parallels. So could Edwin still have made the mimic in the games? Yes, of course. But it bugs me from a storytelling perspective. We suddenly have a new antagonist with no connection to anything or anyone that came before and his creator is some inventor that's now dead? It's just not very compelling. Anytime we've had some strange new antagonist, Circus Baby, Inner, Glitch Trap, Vanny, they've all been connected in some way to what came before. Am I saying that I want William back for the hundredth time? Not really. But I want some kind of connection, a reason to care about the new villain. So I know it's controversial, but Edwin being a parallel for Henry is very compelling. They're brilliant inventors with a gift for animatronics, single fathers with young children who die tragically. And in the games, we don't see how Henry responds to that grief, but it's pretty evident that he stepped away from the company just like Edwin did. Now, I'm not saying that I think Henry pulled a fourth closet and the mimic is really a Charlie bot who was stolen by Afton and became Circus Baby slash Elizabeth. FNAF does make some very compelling arguments for that, but I just don't see any real evidence that Henry built the Charlie bots in the game timeline. And also now that we've seen the mimic, I just don't see it being Circus Baby in any form. But just like Edwin, Henry could have easily designed an animatronic to watch over Charlie. No, no, that's just crazy. That but we do have evidence in the games that Henry wanted an animatronic to protect Charlie. What if, what if the mimic was a test run of that, a rough draft, so to speak? And then Henry went on to design the security puppet to watch out for Charlie at the pizzeria while he kept the mimic around to entertain her at home. Okay, a theory is starting to take shape. So Henry was developing an AI that could learn the patterns around it with the goal of protecting his daughter when he couldn't be there. His first run of it was a little rudimentary, made of scraps, but he was on the right track. He could see that it was learning from his daughter. So he goes on to make the security puppets with the same mimic programming to guard Charlie at the pizzeria while she continued to play with the mimic at home. We know how Charlie's story ended and then Henry went away for a while 
but not before infusing the Mimic with his agony. When Henry returns, he intends to put all the spirits to rest. So he constructs a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place near his workshop where the Mimic was left. A location that, like Edwin's workshop, has double doors that lock behind you. Doors labeled Charlie Door. After Henry's plan is complete and he's dead, Fazbear Entertainment comes to inspect the property where they find the Mimic. Like in the epilogues, they decide to put it to use, clearing out the old pizzeria while they build on top of it. I'm guessing they also found some old circuit boards, and since Henry was such a genius, they immediately sent them over to the development team for their VR game to scan them for pathfinding. But then the Mimic Endo started killing people, and they realized they might have made a mistake. So they steeled it away in the old pizzeria and took the circuit boards back from the development team. The drawers have been emptied out. Someone was here. Who? I don't think it was spring cleaning either. No. No. There was plastic on the floor. Someone was definitely here during the night. It had to have been the client. I mean, they sent us that stuff in the first place with no explanation, told us to scan it, said it would expedite the process so we wouldn't need to program any pathfinding ourselves. Oh. It was a budget thing, I guess. Oh, yeah, budget thing. It was thing. just junk. Circuit boards and things like that. Yeah, okay. Look pretty old. Somehow, though, there was usable code on some of them. <laughs> yeah. It seemed to take hold by itself. Oh, that's normal. Things started changing. Uh-huh. But then, he started appearing. At least that's what Jeremy said. But it was too late. The mimic programming was scanned in, it got a rundown of Afton's greatest hits, and it became Glitch Trap. With that, let's move on to the origin of Vanny. No, not Vanny. Vanny. The Virtual Augmented Neural Network Integration Units. To me, this seems like something that was created by Vanny and probably Gregory when they were under the control of Glitchtrap. It's morphing the user's reality, and I think we see the end goal of it in the Brazil ending. To put you in a fantasy world while it gains control of your body. Everything in the Pizzaplex is linked through this AR network. We see that in the control room, the cameras, even the wet floor bots. So when Gregory unleashed the glitch trap virus into the Pizzaplex, this seems like the most logical place to do that. And we can see evidence of that in Helpy when his eyes turn yellow and purple veins appear. We know this is not the Mimic 1 programming taking over because Gregory Mimic argues with it. What, what happened to it? I took care of it. This area is safe for now. It is simply helping being influenced by the Glitchtrap virus in the system. And yes, I do think Glitchtrap is still in the picture. While it's very obvious that Princess Quest is the canon ending of Security Breach, there's a sword in the machine, Headless Freddy and Fazer Blast, the ending paralleled in the Brazil ending, and it's the only ending that doesn't have a comic, the third Princess Quest game doesn't end in us defeating Glitchtrap. It ends in us unlocking a door to free Vanessa. Even the fact that you can see the shadow of Glitch Trap behind the machine and some Glitch bunnies around it seems to imply to me that he's still out there. Which, that would explain all the bunny ears and why the animatronics still attack us if Glitch Trap is still in the system and affecting everything. And while on this subject, I feel like I need to address Burnt Trap. Even though Princess Quest is the only canon ending of Security Breach, I think all the endings had the potential to be canon. And what I mean by that is if Gregory had gone down to the loading dock, he would have found a van. If he'd pressed the button instead of playing Princess Quest, he could have disassembled Vanny. And if he'd gone down beneath the Pizza Plex, he would have found Burn Trap. Just because in the true ending he didn't go down there doesn't mean anything else we saw in that ending changed. That's confirmed in the fact that we'd see the blob, or I guess now the tangle, in ruin. So where is Burn Trap now? It would be nice if I could say, oh, he's the Mimic. There was an animatronic trapped down below the Pizza Plex in both Security Breach and Ruin, so it's clearly the same one he just took off the suits. But for one, they seem to have entirely different goals. Burn Trap was hacking animatronics through a TV, trying to take control of everything. The Mimic's just trying to get out, it seems. And when you look at their models, they aren't even remotely similar. Sire Squawks did an excellent video comparing the models in depth, which I'll link in the description. 
I'd like for them to be the same. It'd been my theory before Ruin came out, but I just don't see it. I don't think Burn Trap is Afton Return, though. I've been saying this since Security Breach came out. He's just Afton's remains possessed by Glitch Trap. That's why his eyes are purple and why he can attack Freddy by just touching a screen. Afton is being tortured in Ultimate Custom Night, and Glitchtrap is just piloting his corpse. So after the events of Security Breach, Glitchtrap would know that he had just lost both of his servants. It'd be reasonable to think that they might come back to dispose of him, so he needs to get out. We saw in Security Breach that he has some kind of influence over the Tangle, so he got it to dig a way out and then escaped. What happened here? It looks like the whole place fell in. Something tunneled out, broke everything. Now I'm stuck here. This also explains why Fazbear Entertainment didn't have a chance to repair any of the animatronics or get Freddy out of Fazer Blast, because they had to shut down due to Earthquake immediately. So when Vanessa and Gregory do return, they find the underground pizzeria even more damaged, but with no burn trap. The Tangle has clearly been roaming around the area making tunnels, and one of these tunnels leads Gregory and Vanessa to the Mimic. I really don't know what it is, but it's been trapped down here a really long time. I think the Mexus machine was already there. It looks pretty old, and Gregory doesn't say he designed it, just that it was designed to contain the Mimic. So it was probably designed by the Fazbear technicians, like Cassie's dad. But it's also clear from Gregory's knowledge and his backpack in the room that he did something with the machine. So I think Gregory realized that, due to all the damage, the Mimic could get out, or is close to being able to do so. So he integrates the Mexus machine with the Vanny network that we've already established he's knowledgeable about. This spreads out the security throughout the Pizzaplex and keeps the Mimic contained. He also sets up some nodes in the immediate area to prevent it from reaching out. Unfortunately, the Mimic was able to disable the nearest nodes, which allowed him to reach out to Cassie. As for the Mexus entity, I like what Raito said about it being designed by Cassie's dad, since he is a technician and Bonnie was apparently his favorite animatronic. I'm just theorizing that it happened back when they first sealed away the Mimic. And like Rai said in their theory, this could also mean that he had been logged in on the computer down there and that's how the Mimic was able to reach out to Cassie in the first place. Obviously, this is all just touching on the mystery surrounding Ruin. There are still questions of Cassie's relationship to Gregory, how the wet floorbots are related to Glamrock Bonnie, why there's a scooper, and does it give us enough information to solve some of the lingering questions of Security Breach? I'm still working on my answers for those questions, so if you have any ideas, feel free to leave them in the comments. Stay hyper and keep theorizing, friends.